I don't get to watch a lot of television. Do we watch television anymore or do we stream video of programs that used to be broadcast on television? New platform. It's the same type of thing, right? But there, were, there was a program that was on a few years ago called Dirty Jobs. You guys ever like watching Dirty Jobs? Mike Rowe. What a voice that guy has. I'm not envious, but kind of biblically jealous of what a great voice he has and what a great job he has. And he writes, he blogs, and it's got a little video. It's kind of fun to watch every, way, every weekend, I guess it's on. But he recently wrote a series of blog postings about this issue of vocation and how many people in our culture today are kind of missing the point of vocational aspirations, especially as it pertains to the things that they are passionate about. And when you think about the passions that we have, do you always get to pursue your passions? And if you do, can you make a living at it? Now, Mike's dad sounds like my dad, saying, I know you like broadcasting, son, but you'll never make a living at it. Well, 35 years later, I would respectfully beg to differ. But it hasn't been easy. I mean, following our passions sounds so wonderful, doesn't it? I mean, that's how I feel. That's what I'm committed to. But is it what we're called to? We're talking about vocation this week and Luther's kingdom of the two world or the two kingdoms. And when we talk about vocation, oftentimes, what do you think about? Your job, right? I mean, we have a group of dedicated teachers who are here at AVCS and several of them were in worship with us today and we had a chance to pray for them and with them for what they are called to do. But you ask these teachers, is this your job? And they'll say, no, it's much more than a job. And if you look at Webster's Dictionary, they're right. It's much more than, I mean, that's one of three definitions of the word vocation. One of them is your work. One of them is how you organize as an individual or group for a common cause. Not necessarily work-related. Could be any relation, quite frankly. And then one of the definitions even goes so far as to say it's a spiritual thing, like going into ministry of some sort. You know, as Christians, we could look at Webster's definition of vocation and ask, okay, well, which one is it? Is it the job part? Is it the getting together as a group part? Is it the spiritual part? And I think the answer to that is yes. It's not any one of those. It's all three of them working together in harmony in conjunction. And where we see this playing out is in Luther's issue with the two kingdoms to which we are called to live. Is that me? Let's try that. Maybe it's not. If it is, I'll just go over to the pulpit. How about this? Okay. It just means I have to get animated from the pulpit. That's fine. Luther talked about the two kingdoms, and I think we understand what they are. But how do they work? And how do we work in them? Now, the two kingdoms we say in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught his disciples this, and this is the prayer which we learn from. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. So you have two kingdoms. There's a kingdom on earth and there's a kingdom in heaven. I think we can all agree. Not only are there two kingdoms, but the two kingdoms have two different sets of rules. Because what's happening in earth right now is a lot different than what's happening in heaven. At least I hope so. I can't imagine that there are earthquakes and hurricanes and protests and anger in heaven like there is happening on earth right now. They have two different rules. And it's up to us in the body of Christ to be able to rightly distinguish between the two. But it's even more important now because the reality is we live in both of these places. And it's interesting how Jesus, when he's praying, in the middle of this whole Gethsemane, getting ready to go to the cross thing, doesn't say, I'm praying, Lord, that you take them with me but I'm praying that you protect them while they're here. So how do we rightly distinguish between how we're supposed to live as Christians, citizens of heaven, and how we're supposed to live as Christians, citizens of earth? Well, perhaps maybe a better place to start than saying, what are the rules in each location, is who's actually in each location? When you get right down to it, there are two different types of people. 
I know that you might be thinking about different people groups or genders or denominational differences or what Facebook has 31 different genders. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of division in the culture as to who actually lives among us. But the reality is there are two kinds of people in the world. There are Christians and there are not Christians. I mean, at the end of the day, Jesus made it very perfectly clear. There's a sheep category and a goat category. There are those who are redeemed and those who are not redeemed. Yet, I like to say. Now, I don't believe universally that everyone is going to be redeemed. But for those who have been called according to his purpose, we know the beauty of the gift of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We live in a sinful, fallen world. And heck, part of the reason it's a sinful, fallen world is because we're sinful, fallen people. I mean, God creates paradise. John read in Genesis chapter 1. If you ever go through that whole little lineage of how the world came into being and how we became into being, and how many times do you read, God created this and saw that it was what? Good. And how do we define good? In our culture, good's like, eh, good. How you doing? Good. Not great or fantastic or awesome or amazing. Well, when you look at the Hebrew Good has a whole different connotation. Good means no sin, no pain, no death. So now, the next time someone asks you how you're doing and they say good, go, wow! I want to hang around you. You're doing good? You can say biblical good or earthly good. Maybe that's a good way to describe the two. But in the middle of all that, God created mankind in his image. In their image, male and female, he created them. And said, have dominion over all the earth, and this is good. As children of God, you were created in that image and are being recreated as new creatures, the way God envisioned you. Isn't that a great thought? Don't look so glum. That's really good news. And I mean good in the biblical sense. Now, the flip side of that is that there's a temporal world that we live in right now. See, Luther went so far as to say, hey, look, if we were as we were created to be and we were living where we were created to live, we wouldn't need temporal authority like we have in the world right now. And by temporal authority, that just means laws, courts, politicians, police officers, speeding tickets, stop signs, all those things that we have here that tell us how to act in this world. We wouldn't need those. But Luther said, no, we have to have those because as Christians created for that purpose, if we're living out our purpose and everyone is a child of God, we don't need all those temporal things. We don't need lawyers. We don't need judges. We don't need cops. We don't need exit signs and traffic tickets and warnings on the McDonald's cup that you might burn if you spill in your lap. None of that's necessary, but the temporal world has evil in it, and so we need those authorities basically to keep us from killing each other. Do you become any more of a moral citizen because you drive 45 miles an hour on Aliso Creek Road? Do you become immoral if you drive 60? Probably not. But you might get a speeding ticket or try coming down the toll road at less than 85 miles an hour. I mean, that's a... 6% grade, I feel like I'm on a ride at Disneyland. It's amazing how fast you can go. It really wears out your brakes if you don't go too fast. So, you know, you have to go a little faster. Just saying. Everybody's giggling like, yeah, I know, I know. Those are the two people that inhabit, inhabit the two kingdoms. And the two kingdoms then have those different rules. God's kingdom is perfect. The temporal authority is basically don't kill each other. So in the middle of that backdrop... Jesus prays, God, I'm praying not that you take them out of the world. I'm going. I'm sending a comforter, but leave them here and protect them. John 13, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love one another. John 14, verse 3, he says, I'm going away. I'm coming back again. I'll leave a counselor. You'll know the way to go. And Thomas says, uh-uh, no, we don't, verse 5. In verse 6, Jesus says, here's the way to go. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So by the time we get to verse 17, Jesus is saying, Father, protect them. So how are we supposed to live in this protection? He says, 
sanctify them, or in the King James, consecrate them. Sanctification, consecration, it all involves us being set apart. But consecration takes it a step further. Set apart and equipped for the purpose of engaging the world. So set apart, but able to engage. Set apart, but able to engage. Well, if you're set apart but able to engage, that means set apart doesn't begin and end with setting apart. Like, for example, here at ABCS, during the week, our teachers are equipping students who have been set apart. Their parents have said, we want you to come here and get good, godly, biblical instruction. However, we want you to be trained up so that you can engage the culture with these good biblical values. Because if you don't have those biblical values, you won't be able to stand in today's culture. You'll be like someone living in Mexico who has four major earthquakes in the span of about a week and now is walking around going, do I trust the... No, I just, this is solid. I'm going to stay right here. Because I don't know what's going to happen with the ground around me and I don't know what's going to happen culturally either. See, people who live under the temporal authority don't have that firm foundation to stand on. They're relying on the law. They're relying on politicians. They're relying on rallies and protests and all sorts of things that they hope will bring some kind of morality and decency, and it never will. It wasn't intended to that. If you see somebody outside the church this week and they're railing about anything and they're trying to find a legal solution, just imagine that they're driving in a car that's on all spare tires, those tiny little donut wheels that are just enough to get you to the shop for what? New tires the tires that the car was intended to run on. We're not intended to live eternally under this temporal authority. And yet there are people in the world who are lost who are saying, this is the way we're supposed to live. But Jesus prays, no. John chapter 17, 17 and 18. Lord, they're standing on your truth. Set apart, consecrated, but equipped to engage. See the give and the take, the push and the pull, and that's how we are to live. And we understand the two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven, which is perfect and beautiful, and we long for it, and our souls should want it, and the temporal authority, which is we have to deal with it. It's what we're called to do. Now, during the course of your lifetime, during the course of this week, heck, sometime today, you're going to realize how many different hats you wear in the culture. You're a parent, you're a child, you're a student, you're a teacher, you're a boss, you're an employee, you're an entrepreneur, you're a consumer. And you spiritually are also going to wander through that saint and sinner deal often today. Your spiritual nature is being sanctified and purified, but it's at war with the sin nature inside of you. And you'll ask, gosh, Lord, how long do I have to endure these two kingdoms? Remember the foundation you're standing on. The foundation of faith. The foundation of truth. The foundation of grace. How solid God's word is. It's really easy as a Christian to be able to walk in the two worlds when you understand what your foundation is. It's baseball season now and my beloved angels are mercifully almost eliminated from the playoffs. Oh, it's excruciating. It's fun to listen to the announcers, too. Hey, it doesn't look like the Angels have a chance of making the playoffs. Really? It's a newsflash from May. Anyway. But the Dodgers, on the other hand, are playing very well. Yeah? Who wooed for the Dodgers? Yeah. That's right. I mean, that, this really impressive 5-19 and 19 run they've been on to get into the playoffs has been really incredible. See, there's a little sarcasm there because they were playing really, really well and then they kind of started to stink and then they are playing kind of okay again and they'll probably get knocked down the first round of the playoffs. Wait, did I say that out loud? Sorry. <laughs> there's a guy who pitches for the Dodgers by the name of Rich Hill and he's an interesting study in perseverance and vocation and calling. So guy's 37 years of age now. Dodgers signed him last year to a multi-year contract at 36. Now, this is kind of, you know, they want the young baseball players, 18, 19, 20, you know. Who are the, you know, Lindor from the Indians is 23, and the Cubs have all these young guys, and, you know, because the, they're going to be, you want them to be really great now, but you want them to be great for the next 10 years, right? And if they're great when they're young, then you don't have to pay them as much. When they get older, then you have to pay them. So, Rich Hill, the exact opposite. He got drafted and 
2000 or something like that. Decided to go to college. Two years later, he got drafted by some team in Anaheim. They didn't offer him enough money, so he stayed in college. And then a couple years later, he got drafted by the Cubs, and he made it in the league, and he's in and out and up and down and played for a lot of different teams, wore a lot of different hats, literally, because he was on a lot of different teams. Finally, by the end of the 2014 season, he decided that he wanted to be a starter, and no major league team would give him a look. So he signed with the Independent League. The Independent League is like one of those last gasp leagues, you know, where you're playing, you have to wait for the slow pitch softball team to finish, and then you guys go out and play a professional baseball team. You know, you're sponsored by Chico's Bail Bonds and all that. You're just, you, there's, there's not a lot of money in independent baseball. And thank you for getting the Bad News Bear reference. Well, he decided he was going to reinvent, at age 35, he was going to reinvent himself as a starter and get noticed. And so he pitched in the independent league, and lo and behold, the A's said, hey, we kind of stink and we don't have a lot of money. You want to come pitch for us? Now, that's probably not how the meeting went, but I mean, the A's haven't been a great team for a while. So he signs with the A's, and all of a sudden, he has a good year. Gets the trading deadline. The Dodgers are like, hey, we need a left-handed starter. We'll trade for him. Okay, so he pitches for the Dodgers. They go to the National League Championship Series where that other team that wears blue beat them. It's kind of, you know, we won't get into it too much. Right, Dave? We won't talk about the Cubs too much in front of all the Dodger fans. Dodgers say, hey, you're great, Rich Hill. We're going to sign you with a three-year deal for $48 million. Wow, at age 37? And I'm saying, smite me, Lord, now. I'll do it for half. <laughs> so he's pitching for the Dodgers this year, and he's doing all right. August 24th, he takes the ball in Pittsburgh. He's pitching against the Pirates, and they're kind of a mm, team this year too. So gets the first three guys out, then gets the next three guys out, and the next three guys out, then the next three guys out. And then MLB.com says, hey, Rich Hill has a perfect game, but we're not trying to jinx it to 3 million subscribers. Sixth inning gets them all out, seventh, eighth. Well, the Dodgers aren't scoring, so it's a scoreless tie. Way to waste a perfect game, guys. I mean, come on, you're making history here. Could somebody get a hit? The Dodgers are like, no, we're going to go on a 20-game losing streak. We're just getting warmed up. <laughs> so the Dodgers don't score in the ninth, so Rich Hill takes the ball in the bottom of the ninth. He's only thrown like 80 pitches. And he first guy comes up and it's ground ball to Logan Forsythe and he boots it so now there's an error a guy gets on base but it's still a no hitter and it's still a shutout gets the next three guys out so now we finish nine innings and he's got a no hitter and he's going into the 10th and all of a sudden people are going hey Harvey Haddock Pittsburgh Pirates and you know it's really unprecedented so the Dodgers come up in the 10th and what do they do they don't score so Rich Hill takes the ball and goes out and pitches to Josh Harrison to start off the bottom of the 10th Two balls, one strike, nobody out, grooves a fastball, boom, and there it goes. Into the seats. Home run. Pirates won, Dodgers nothing, and here comes that 10-game losing streak for the Dodgers. Really let the air out of their sails for a while. He went from a perfect game to the losing pitcher in a matter of minutes. So he goes home after the series is over, Got a wife and a four-year-old son. His wife and he had spoken, but she knew what to say and what not to say. But what do you say after such a huge letdown, right? He said, so all of a sudden I'm giving my wife a hug and I feel this tug on my sleeve and it's my four-year-old. And he said, you know, within about 35 seconds, I'm sitting on the couch watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with my son. <laughs> and in that moment I saw, I did anyway, took off the baseball player hat, put on the dad hat. Because which has better payoff? Which has a better eternal investment? Oh, sure, being a professional baseball player is special. Any professional athlete is a privilege. There aren't that many people who get to make it to the higher echelons of sports. But he knew his vocation included more than just making $48 million throwing fastballs. And in that moment, I think he's going to pay off a bigger eternal dividend with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the couch with his four-year-old. As we move forward in our faith, in this life that we are, we live in the two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the temporal authority. We are called to live vocationally, but it's more than just your job. It's whom you associate with and how the Spirit is leading you. How is He leading you? 
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of grace by faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that you've given to those of us who proclaim your name and sing the praises of being your children. We love you. We're amazed by you. We're so grateful that you've rescued us. But you've rescued us and set us apart from the world to be equipped to be your children and to be your ministers in the world and through the world. Help us to live in that newness of life each and every day. In Jesus' name.